story talks back. Almost everything that we remember, think about, or imagine is a story. Stories entertain us, inform us, and even define us. They have upsides and they have downsides. This podcast explores the power of story in every aspect of our lives. I'm Dave Stanton. Thank you for joining us. Bianca Stone is a gifted poet, visual artist, creator of poetry comics, and educator. Her brand new verse collection, What is Otherwise Infinite, has been featured on NPR and in the New York Times, and has been called extraordinary by the Washington Post. Stone is also the author of The Mobius Strip Club of Grief and Someone Else's Wedding Vows, as well as A Little Called Pauline, a children's book with text by Gertrude Stein. Stone teaches poetry and is creative director at the Ruth Stone House in Vermont. Well, hey, Bianca, thank you so much for joining me on the Story Talks Back. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, David. It's my pleasure. Um, and I think we talked about you starting out by reading a poem from, from your new book. Um, do you want to say anything about it? Uh, or you just want to read it? I could just read it. Okay. See what, if anything, I think of when I read it. It's called The Body. I'm tired of algorithms. I was promised oblivion. Now I must remake world order. Nothing changes. All these nerves and yellow lacy fat. It hides in a stupor in plain sight. I yank it around like a mule. Cannot live by it. What is it? What is it but a stained document you turn in to the school nurse? A parchment you've been clutching forever that turns out blank. Nice. That's funny. I don't think I've read that out loud yet. Um, But I remember at the time that I wrote this poem, I was reading um, this fantasy series called uh, the Wheel of Time series. Uh, and it was like, I was taking a real intellectual break. I just needed like something to lose myself in. And those books, I got, I re I got really into them. But the, I remember, there was one character in it who was always like screaming about oblivion. He was like an immortal God and he was like miserable and wanted to die. And um, that's where that line came from. <laughs> I was promised oblivion. It's interesting that you, you say that everything boils down to a parchment, a piece of paper, Yeah, I mean, it kind of speaks back. I didn't think of it till now, but later I, I wrote a really long poem that's in a book, in, in this book, um, Illuminations, that's about um, illuminated manuscripts mm. and how how uh how beautiful that humans are able to you know we're kind of created paper out of um i mean not just natural objects but pieces of animal guts and stuff like that um and able to make beautiful art on it and express um express myth myths and you know religious stories in there um and there's something about the, you know, there's something about paper, writing things down on paper uh, that's reminded me of the body. Um, I guess that it feels like an object versus mm -hmm. thoughts in the head, in the mind. Um, 
but uh, we put so much emphasis on, I think this poem is about uh, just feeling a little bit detached from the body, um, something we all experience frequently. Um, but it's, uh, I don't know. It's like our body contains all our thoughts, obviously. Um, so they're, they're really the same thing, but they feel very different. Um, or, or we act as if they are completely separate and different. Uh, and the book we, has a, the book has a lifespan too, right? The book itself is an object. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's an impermanent object that is. It's organic. Organic and, you know, confined to the, you know, mechanisms of time. Uh, and yet there's something. it makes it feel as if our thoughts and ideas are more permanent than our body. I hope that's the case. Right. So, yeah. That's funny because when I was a kid, I remember I used to think that books lasted forever. Like that was my expectation. If you owned a book, it was going to be around a thousand years from now. But now that I've lived with books for so long, I've seen them in so many different stages of coming apart, you realize they have their own sort of trajectory, right? Yeah, I was just arguing with my mother about this because she wanted a newspaper article that had a review of my book in it. And I was like, well, you already have one, you don't need two. And I was like, in any way it's online. And she's like, you know, online could be erased in a minute. Uh, yeah, right. But um, I mean, online, publications feel so much less permanent than maybe a book um but both are are far from permanent um right I, I when i bought your book i bought it initially on my phone just because i thought it would be more convenient your mm -hmm. latest book and it's just so different the relationship to the the words when you're it's it's not a book. It's not tactile. It's it's you know it's still powerful, but it, it's a different, uh, totally different experience. Which I don't do much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but sometimes when you don't have time to wait for it to come in the mail or something, right? Uh, you have to buy it online. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to talk to you about um, you know my whole sort of obsession here is stories and mm -hmm. storytelling. So, um, you know, the question I, I usually start my interviews with is, who, who do you remember or who do you feel was like a storyteller or what was a story that really influenced you early on or that you feel shaped you somehow? Can you identify one or two that you really come to mind? Yeah, I was trying to think about that. Um, a specific story, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I wasn't thinking of that, but I was thinking about what it means to hear stories really early on. And mm. children do. I mean, not only are they read to all the time um, because they can't read yet, uh, but they're also listening to everybody talking um, and they can't partake in the conversation as much. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of listening to stories. Um, uh, for me, I grew up with a single mother who was very, she, she was uh, a writer and she wrote fiction. So um, I did get to hear a lot of her writing and um, she was also very good at telling stories on the spot. Um, and she would have certain stories that she would retell that, you know, she made up. Um, 
and she was very good at doing different voices. She was very theatrical um, and she would get very into it. So I, I think just my excitement around um, around the whole the whole body's engagement with the story, you know, the gestures and the voices and um, everything was very thrilling to me. And it really did shape how I um, embody telling stories and poems, you know, and feeling very, uh, it, they don't, they really don't just exist on the page. It feels like something to, to read out loud and to share out loud. Um, You know, I was thinking of of certain books she read me that were really influential, and um, I loved the Wizard of Oz stories very much. Um, yeah. Although they're kind of all over the place, but at the same time, really repetitive. If you read all the books. Um, Wind in the Willows was one that my grandma was obsessed with and read me all the time. And that story really affected me. Um, but I'm trying to think of a story that isn't necessarily a book. Uh, um, oh, oh I, one thing just came to me. The Norse mythology stories, those, oh. I was so fascinated by it because they were definitely weirder than other stories I was used to. And um, I found them very fascinating. And I remember there was one, I forget who it was, but it was like, might've been the origin of the gods or something, but there was this one man who had long golden hair and it was frozen in the ice and they found a single hair sticking out of the ice and like from that came forth like man or something like it was like uh you know things like that i just found like wow there's just um it's magical yeah, yeah. and do you think of yourself as a storyteller No, I, I don't actually, uh, but I like to think about how narrative works a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, mythology itself has um, so much, it, it just, in, it just, it seems to be like pervading everything, even without us knowing it in our own words and language that we use. And so I feel like there's so much storytelling that's been, that's just infused into our language. And especially if you're uh, like read a lot of books, like I do, um, it weaves itself into my stories and I don't, I'm not even really aware of it, but I think what I think of with storytelling is that for me, you know, there's so much emphasis on not making things up as opposed to like fiction writers would be more concerned with making things up, whatever that means to them, but like um, telling a story versus writing a poem that involves a kind of story for sure. Um, and like, what are the differences there? I'm very interested in that. And, um, you know, more narrative poems are certainly story, you know, they have a story in them, but it's just so much more brief and it, and it focuses in on such a particular thing and angle and it misses and it leaves out a, a bunch. So it's sort of interesting to think about like what storytelling when there's so much left out, when there isn't a beginning, middle and an end. Um, and 
not only that, but what does it mean to tell stories of your life um, in a way that's also not autobiography? So poetry really exists in this interesting space between fiction and autobiography. Um, and of course, it involves so much with musicality. And then, um, you know, that makes me think of like oral traditions of storytelling, which of course involved, you know, required poetry in order to be memorized, um, to be passed down. So even storytelling itself, obviously its origins are in, in a kind of poetry. Um, I remember when I saw you reading, I really felt that there was an element of storytelling in hearing you read those poems because they're so, they have so many characters in them. Mm. I know it's really interesting to think about how characters work in poetry because I mean, in, in poet, poet say the speaker in the poem, I don't say the character. Um, and what does that mean? Like, uh, you know, that, it, that does really lend itself to the idea of the or, orator or um, the storyteller, the speaker of the story. Um, but interestingly, I find this, you know, more and more, the speaker seems to be these different characters of the self, um, which is, uh, you know, I'm sure if you really got down into the mechanisms of how pro of how fiction and prose um, work, you mean you know I I know prose writers talk about you know needing to love all their characters or whatever, but you know and certainly all their characters have some part of them in them. Um, but it's it's so different in poetry where where you're dealing so strongly with um, an interaction with the self. Um, you know, unless you're like Pessoa or something and you're like being very conscious, like making persona poems um, in the voices of other people. But, um, but yeah, I, I find that poetry is like telling a story of certain versions of the self uh, mm -hmm. in different in different manifestations, um, which is a kind of more authentic version of what it is to be human, um, because we're not just one character, you know, in our own life, yet we are characters in our life, you know, we present ourselves very specifically in different situations, and um, we choose our words very, you know, carefully, depending on who, whom we're talking to, and, um, and we sort of edit ourselves as we go. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> have you have you thought about writing stories? Do you think you ever had that impulse? Yeah, I, re I remember back in like you know 2015 or something. I bought Walter Mosley's like this year you write your novel. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to write a novel. Um, I don't know why it suddenly struck me as important. Uh, I, I was, you know, there's certain things that I want to talk about that lend themselves to prose. Um, for some reason, I have a really hard time writing fiction. Um, I find it almost impossible for me to do. I feel really uncomfortable doing it, like making up people. And it's funny when I try, cause I feel like, I feel really embarrassed. Um, and it's, it's weird. I, I know that, you know, if I really, when I was like in high school and stuff, I, I now, probably I find stories I wrote when I was a kid um, and I liked it and I had fun with it. Um, 
because I was good at just, you know, I was good at be, being descriptive and stuff because I was so aware of fiction, of my mom's fiction and um, listening to her. Of course, her stuff's all about her. So it's like barely fiction. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I, I really can't do it. I, I get like, I would get like one page in and then I just couldn't go on. I, you know, I was just like sort of, I'm sort of locked into one page things. Um, nonfiction is something I'm working really hard to do. Uh, and, you know, essay writing is, you know, that's got all, all kinds of intricacies about storytelling. Um, again, it's, it's not, I think it's funny because it does appeal to me to make things up. You know, I, I say in my, when I talk to students about poetry, like do not be beholden to reality. Um, at the same time, I'm not, you know, and, and also to lie, to go ahead and lie in poems. And I think that's important, but, um, but it's still, it's, it's really different um, because I think what I'm more concerned with is like, being actually honest about the ambiguities of being alive and our experience in reality, which we have this like false sense of the way things are um, a lot of the time. And I think what gives us a lot of anxiety is that we need to honor the more imaginative and uh, contradictory parts of our own experience. And to do that, you have to you you have to be creative and imaginative in how and how you express it in words. So, um, in other words, it's not about like information giving, like like you know, uh, sort of Cartesian like cold hard facts about what you're seeing, almost like a scientific, uh, you know, imp like empirical based you know, vision of what you're experiencing isn't actually accurate to existence, you know, there, there's more at work right. and accessing that is what the writer's trying to do. And I think when we create stories, we're trying to, we're trying to, what are we trying to do? Um, I wonder about that uh, you know uh, expressing some kind of desire um explaining 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 what um what what do you think when when you uh when you became obsessed with the idea of storytelling um did you feel like you gravitated more towards the idea of um, the fantastical or telling stories of experiences? I mean, I'm interested in all of it. I mean, I personally kind of am like you. I don't, I don't feel comfortable writing fiction. Okay, yeah. I actually did. I really enjoyed it when I, I was taking a class at it. And then I, I was really, I had a great time. But then once the assignment was over, I just had no, like I, you know, so many fiction writers talk about, oh, the story, the characters are just talking to me all the time, you know, or, mm. or um, you know, I just couldn't stop the story from coming. And it's like, I've, I've never had that experience. I think I probably, mm. so I'm much more in sort of the journalism slash nonfiction mode, but I, I love reading those stories. Um, and I, one thing about you that I think is really fascinating um, is your interest in poetry comics. Mm. I think that's a really cool medium that that sort of straddles, you know, in the sense that, you know, I think you even said, you know, that the frame, you know, sort of the, the passage from frame to frame and the sequencing just sort of naturally turns it into a story. Do you think that's one of the reasons maybe you like that format? 
yes it has a forward momentum to it um and that is appealing to me and i there's this sort of sense of being on a journey in a poetry comic and i think comics in i i've always loved comics so much and um another thing i love but can't do you know uh tradition in the traditional way uh but i love playing with it and i love playing with the the mechanisms of comics so like the panel and the word bubbles and you know and the white space on the page and and how you can make a static image but also have it move forward um and having those contradictions are, are it's very appealing to me but then also i think the aspect of the image and adding another layer of of meaning making and having the image interact with the text and having the reader interact with all with both the image and the text at the same time and seeing you know it, it adds it's like another tool to get at something that you can't get at otherwise um and i'm not sure what it is like i'm not i'm not sure even what i'm trying to get at but i think what i like is that um that i have those those tools to to play with um and you know the graphic novel i remember it had a real boom when i was like you know growing up and it it was kind of a new thing and everybody was really excited about it because it was almost like legitimizing comics you know it was like a more intellectual or you know more complicated serious comic strip uh and you could go in different places and tell long stories and it wasn't um and they had a beginning and an end it wasn't sort of like marvel it just goes on and on uh and those are cool but obviously like nothing like what what i do sometimes with poetry comics which is like just the same thing i'm talking about already just like how to tell a story without telling a story <laughs> Um, what was your first exposure to that form? I mean, did you did you create that or did you see it somewhere? No, I I mean, everyone who says they do it kind of does it in a different way. Some people are more in the comic world and they're more they lean more on the comic book aspects. Other people are more in the poetry world and they use more like collage and things like that. Um, and I became, I was really obsessed with it for a long time. Uh, it started in graduate school um, with working with Ann Carson because we were bringing in different genres into the classroom. And I, I've always drawn um, pen and ink usually. And so I was doing that in, in my MFA. So that was like, oh, wow, I can bring my drawing into my poetry you know academia life and and it was great i had I was having a lot of fun with it also i was got really into the new york school poets like john ashbury and joe brainerd and stuff and they collaborated all the time with visual artists and i really that was really something that felt in the spirit of my family and but was really different and um and again, like I said, I was always, I've always loved comics. Um, and it was just, it was just like a perfect, I had never heard the term before. It's not a common term. Plus some people say comic poetry, you know. Um, but my teacher at the time, Matthew Rohr, who's a great poet, um, was like, oh, you should check out poetry comics. And he showed me some stuff and the poet Mattia Harvey, who's a great lover of text and image coming together. She, she was teaching 
poetry comic stuff in some of her workshops and so I she she and I talked a lot about it and stuff like that right. um, yeah right hmm? and you're I mean you are also you know wonderful visual artist um I know you did some illustrations for Ann Carson um how, how do you sort of decide have, have you ever thought about illustrating one of your own books poetry no, I, you know, like a book of poetry, like my new book, no. Um, you know, those poems are are just poems on the page in, in a more traditional way. But like I did a book called Poetry Comics, the Book of Hours, and that's like a collection of random poetry comics that I've done over the years. And there's one one I, I did, one, probably the longest and most successful one I've ever done uh, was a poem that was in my first book, actually. And I did make a poetry comic that it was really, you know, at the time I was deeply into my drawing and painting and um, that poem lent itself really well to the comic book because it was, every line was very like self-contained. Um, and I do really want to do a book of poetry comics eventually that's more comprehensive and long, but I've just gotten very carried away with other interests. And unfortunately, I'm not drawing at all anymore. Um, huh. But I will, I, right now, my computer is sitting on Carl Jung's The Red Book. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's something, you know, I said to myself, if I do do a poetry comics book, in the near future, it will be more akin to this book because um, I, I think what interests me so much about doing visual art and words together is more the sort of um, uh, almost like a free association that happens when I'm doing it. So I learn a lot about what's happening in my subconscious more. Uh, you can express things that are completely ineffable with images sometimes. And seeing what, if you sit down to draw on a blank piece of paper with nothing, no plan, I mean, weird things come out. Um, and I, I really like the idea of doing that and then adding poetry into it too. And, you know, maybe working with things I've already written and then seeing what images come out in response to them and stuff like that. So, um, I mean, that's certainly what Young was doing. He was he was finding a way to experiment with his own kind of self analysis um, with the the illuminated text. So coming back to what we were talking about earlier with my poem about illuminated manuscripts, um, you know, I find something really beautiful about the act of of making art in telling a story at the same time um, on a piece of paper and seeing what uncontrollable things start occurring on the paper. Um, for me, it's about, for me, poetry comics are all about experimentation. And in that way, it's, um, they're very alternative in their form, for sure. Do you think that you, you really want to experiment with all the forms that you work with? Yes, I want to keep experimenting and see how far I can take things. I, I feel like everything is a failure in a way, you know, like everything and not in a bad way, uh, in, a, in a good way. They're all beautiful failures um, <laughs> because there it's you know, I, I think I'm always trying to find the precise way to say something, you know, and I'm, it can take so long thinking about a line, you know, it's, it's not even, it's like, you know, this, you sit down and you think, I want to tell a story, say, about my squirrel getting stuck in the bird feeder earlier today. Like, I have that desire. I know there's something in that story that is interesting and there's, and I can, 
I don't know what's going to happen even like why people care like I don't even know why yet but I'm going to figure it out so there's experimentation and just the desire to pick to, to write something um there's so many different ways you can go about it right and so that's why we end up writing the same poem over and over again because we're trying to get it in a set in a specific way and we don't know that way but we know you know there's ways that are good enough and a lot of times those end up being the end result but for me I'm like it was good enough but I want it to be I want it to like hit some other level of like understanding and I only know I've hit I I kind of know I hit it sometimes you know but I really know I hit it when I see people's reactions to it mm -hmm. and their and their reaction that satisfies me which is one of like awe and devastation or something like mm -hmm. um yeah I think you know I was thinking about the storytelling too and I was thinking about um how storytelling is a relational act between two people I mean, minimum two two people um and that's really what it's about right i mean it's about communicating something that you've experienced to another person in a way that's engaging that gets at something they could never be there in your mind or at the occurrence of the act so you're like are you here to just tell cold hard facts? No, you're here to do something else. You're here to like make something, make make reality out of it. You know, it's like this thing happened. Is that thing more real than my poem about it? I don't think it is. I think what's more real is our interaction between the story. You know, the story that we're telling between each other, and that me telling you the story, it's like a mother telling her child a story. And she's wrapped with attention. And the mother's telling the story in the best way she can. And the child's mind is like exploding with ideas and like visions. And they're they're picturing it and they're they're associating with it. And they're, you know, they're, I don't even know what's happening if I'm the one telling the story to my daughter, you know. And that's that's how of course how it is. And maybe she'll ask questions and you know, maybe we'll further the story together and like but it always comes back to the fact that we we both need to be engaged in the story together to make the story actually anything. Um, and it seems simple when you say it out loud, but like when you think about it, when you think about how you think about it normally, it's like stories just sit on the page or something, or like stories are stories are stories. The three little pigs is the three little pigs, no matter what. Um, but really it's about people together, right? Yeah, I mean, if you think about the whole oral tradition and how stories were communicated and, you know, in, ingested, it, it, must, it must probably seem to those people that the way we, you know, publish stories and send them out in packages, it'd be so cold maybe, you know, or, or somehow yeah. clinical you know i know and it is it kind of is maybe that's why we're drawn to social media too you know maybe we're just dying to tell stories to each other you know even though we're not face to face um mm -hmm. i wish it was as satisfying as being together and you know reading poems together and in you know seeing the whole body and hearing the, all the inflections of breath and um and being wrapped in the moment together uh, i wish it was that good it's far from that but but um yeah, i mean when you're like reading to your daughter you know i'm sure that her reaction is you're sort of calibrating what you're doing to her reaction right like if she's frustrated or you know obviously i read to my kids you know it, it's so it's like the story is is partly told by the hearer mm -hmm. right yeah if she's if she's bored too i'm like scrambling to make it more you know to her liking if she's scared and too scared you know yeah um 
it's fun. You know, my daughter's five and her stories are like crazy. You know, there's like no, they're all over the place. It's, it's like, there's no structure. It's kind of nonsensical, but then, but it's amazing. You know, it's like, it's like poetry. I love it. They get, it's, what's really sad is that storytelling gets really kind of wrecked in English class. And and that's not the teacher's fault at all, really. Um, it's just our, you know, our, our educational system that's based on factory working and uh, information giving as being the most important thing. And, uh, you know, I hope it's getting better. I hope that's changing. But, uh, you know, once it, once we start telling stories how we think they're supposed to be told, that's when they start getting wrecked, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yet there are some fundamentals to storytelling that stay constant um, too. I think one element of your writing that I, I feel is maybe uh, underappreciated is your humor. You know, you really are so, you know, it's very dry, but it's it's definitely there, you know. And I, I feel like if I if I see you read it, I'm going to get more of that, you know. Um, do you feel like that's something that's in there that people miss? I think if people don't pick up on the humor, which is often dry and um, uh, I don't want to say sarcastic, but I maybe ironic. Um, I don't think they'll enjoy the poem as much. Uh, I think, you know, I, I, it's not like people are roaring with laughter at my readings, but I, you know, people do mention my humor when we talk about my poems. So I, I think people are picking up on it. Um, I talk about very dramatic things. So humor is incredibly important for me in that because it counteracts the drama, but also it's an element of the absurd, um, which one finds oneself in a lot of the time in dramatic situations in life. And um, I often think about and the the fool as a character in you know his human history as being someone who could really tell a lot of truths and uh you know could whisper uh, you know could say things to the king for example that nobody else could say without getting their head chopped off so for me humor is a, a is a almost mystical tool um that is underused um, but also can be overused too. You know, people insist on, you know, they get up at readings and they're like, insist on getting people to laugh. It's, you know, so they can maybe, so they can just feel more comfortable um, and liked, but, but that's not usually the problem. Um, usually the problem is, is that people take themselves too seriously. And take their poems too seriously you know it's kind of like you know sometimes I watch a drama on tv and I'm like the best dramas are the ones that understand that you need humor sometimes too and the shows that just are endlessly dramatic and take themselves so seriously it just it just feels so so boppery you know um yeah thank you for appreciating it <laughs> I want to ask you, um, I mean, you come from a family of writers. Um, you're, you're a writer. H how does your sort of understanding of what it means to be a writer and live as a writer changed? Or how is it evolving, you know, in, in the society, in your own mind? Well, I've learned a lot of things from watching my family uh, that I didn't want to do um, in my life as a writer. <laughs> and things that I did want to do too. I think 
you know, my grandmother lived entirely dedicated to poetry and didn't want to ever settle for anything else. Um, that's just, that was just the way she was. And, you know, she lived in a lot of poverty because of it. Um, and, but she also got by, you know, she also made it, made it work miraculously. Um, I, you know, I think for her, a lot has changed since she was my age or older um, in terms of what the writer's life can look like. And for her and her time, it was a huge emphasis on getting a job at a university teaching and um, teaching undergraduate English or whatever. Uh, I've thought a lot about it and I love teaching and I love teaching literature, um, but I don't love the bureaucracy of academia um, and I don't like the workload. And so I, I know that uh, I love I love teaching. I adore teaching poetry, and and I will always teach poetry. Um, but I really like the idea of of the, this new generation of writers as rethinking the ways that we teach poetry and how we teach it and how we live our lives as writers, and not sort of being having to be a slave to act to that to the institution um, in order to be able to be a legitimate writer. Um, I, I really wanna figure out a way to just be like, I'm a poet and like how to make a living that way is the question. And, you know, I think if you, you make a little family unit and you can all help each other out in like how you wanna live. And we're trying to do that here in my house with, um, I live with my husband and my daughter and my, I live with my twin brother as well, Walter. And we all work on the Roost Stone house together and Walter and Ben unfortunately have to work full-time jobs um, for other people in offices that kind of suck, that totally suck. Um, and they both just want to write and do th engage, do things with poetry and do the Ruth Sun House, but we're, we're, we're not able to su sustain ourselves yet in that way. But, um, but that's the way we will live for the rest of our lives, you know, and that's the way I want to live. Um, and I'm not privileged in a way that I have a lot of like family money or anything that I can just be a poet and not have to worry about it. Like we do, we have to worry about it all the time and we have to make a lot of sacrifices, but I've also worked really hard my entire adult life in order to get to a place where I can live as a poet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do that by, you know, doing manuscript consults and teaching classes online and uh, you know do, you get a paid reading gig you do a free reading gig you know it's that's how it goes um, you do a lot for free for a long time then you finally start getting things that pay enough to keep you going and you still do a lot of things for free but But we do want to make a community so we can help other people, other writers figure out their path, you know, and if they have two professions, like say, you know, you want to be a psychotherapist and a poet or something like that, or, or you want to, you, you want to be a school teacher and you want to be a poet, like figuring out ways to integrate different occupations and make them work in your life is like something that we, we really want to help people figure out. And um, I think waiting for the academia job just is, it's it's just, there's there's just barely any jobs out there in that, even if you did really want it. Um, and you have to get, a, practically have to get a PhD uh, to get a fucking job. And even then, you know, there's 50 other people with a PhD who are going for the same job. But. Uh, Bianca, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for your fun. time. The Story Talks Back is produced and hosted by Dave Stanton. The music you're hearing now was written and performed by Christopher Daydream. The theme music at the beginning of our show is an excerpt from Play by Merlin Twelfthoven, 
performed by Carlos Quartet as part of their 50 for the Future series. Please subscribe to the Story Talks Back on Podbean and check us out on Instagram. See you next time.